Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Skull of Gladiatorius. So, many of you will be familiar with HEMA, historical fencing, and also with modern Olympic fencing. What not so many people are familiar with, probably, is bayonet fencing. But bayonet fencing was actually a massive thing in the 19th century and well into the 20th century, um, later than most people realise. So bayonet fencing, there were literally international competitions of it. Um, the British did fairly well in those. The uh, Japanese did very well. Japanese had a very good reputation for that. They based their um, bayonet method, incidentally, on the use of the uh, Naganata and the Yari. Uh, so they used their traditional martial arts and brought them into, into bayonet method. And um, in, uh, in Britain, there was a long tradition of, of bayonet fighting, in fact, um, going all the way back to the middle of the 19th century and um, was practiced quite um, fervently on a regimental level and competed at. The Royal Marines, incidentally, were still having bayonet competitions, as I understand it, as late as about the 1950s and 60s, uh, so really quite late. Um, but this, what I have here, is the practice um, bayonet with a spring-loaded bayonet plunger, which many of you will have seen before or be familiar with. Um, and this is a heavy object. This weighs about nine pounds. It's the same weight and size as the um, SMLE, Lee Enfield um, bolt action rifle that was used from, I think, 1903 onwards. Um, and uh, famously used in World War One, and in fact the SMLE was still being used in uh, World War Two by a lot of forces, some by choice because some people preferred it to the number four Lee Enfield. I myself have a World War One dated um, SMLE and shoot it and love it, lovely rifle. Um, so this is essentially the practice weapon, it weighs the same as the real rifle and bayonet uh, and therefore it can indeed hit quite hard. If you really clobbered someone with the butt of one of these, um, you would knock them sprawling on the ground, and therefore you need quite a lot of uh, protective equipment. Sometimes they didn't allow strikes with the butt for understandable reasons, because that is not padded, not sprung. Uh, this end is sprung. Obviously you wouldn't be allowed to clout just hit someone with this because you'd break their arm very easily or leg or knock them, give them concussion, whatever. Maybe break their neck, I should think, if you hit them on the neck or back of the head. Um, so they, they probably, for the most part, despite the fact that it was quite rough and tumble, of course, these are soldiers, um, and if they're going to war, you want them to be toughened up a bit. Um, but for the most part, I think that they were probably only allowed to thrust. And sometimes this uh, forged steel knob on the end there uh, did have um, gutter percha or rubber uh, on the end, just to partly probably to, to grip onto the thing you're thrusting, but partly for a bit of shock absorption as well. However, I must say that none of the ones I've ever seen sell ever had any rubber on there. Maybe they wrapped a leather pad or something around there. Um, but by and large, this was used for thrusting and is relatively forgiving. I have taken apart one of these, so this part up here unscrews. In fact, you can see there, I can turn it. It's a long, long thread. The thread's very, very long. Incredibly strong construction, they have to be. The amount of weight and leverage in these means they have to be built very strongly. Um, and it, there's a very long spring inside. So as you can see, you have about, what's that, about maybe 14 or 15 inches of travel here. So it's a long spring with a continuous pressure. It doesn't get more as you go down. So quite cleverly designed things. These uh, plunger bayonets have their roots earlier. Um, the, this is a sort of World War I date one, but um, they have their roots in the late 19th century. Around 1860, uh, we first hear about Wilkinson, the famous sword makers, making something like this with a rubber inside. And it was found that the rubber, uh, I don't really know whether it was a rubber band or I don't, I don't actually know how they're constructed. I only read the patent, but there was rubber inside and it was found that the rubber failed essentially and you ended up losing the, the springiness. And so they replaced these with springs probably by about the 1880s, something like that. Um, and so you do get ver earlier versions of this uh, that aren't obviously modeled on the Lee Enfield, that are modeled on the Martini Henry and Lee Metford, what came before. Um, and um, yeah, so they all achieve the same goal. Right, because this is a heavy object and has the potential to hit hard, you have to wear a lot of protective gear for it. And I've got two here. I've recently shown um, the mask, the helmet, in a different video. So you'll be familiar with it. And you may be familiar with these with seeing pictures or uh, photographs from World War I training. Um, and the Americans had something very similar. This is a British one, uh, World War I dated. I don't think it's got any dates on it, but I thought that some of you might be interested in seeing this more up close and personal. I can't put it on my head 
unfortunately, because the internal padding has perished. But in a way, that gives us a chance to look at how that um, is actually made. Okay. So first off, what we've got, uh, if I bring it around here, is essentially a, get the camera to focus on the mask rather than me, is essentially a very thick wire galvanized steel um, bowl. Okay, so we've got a bowl here, much like a fencing mask, and then it continues, if you can see inside, it continues around the back. So it is a little bit similar like a, to a beefed up fencing mask on the inside, okay, in that you have this uh, very substantial, and notice the shape of it as well, it's shaped a bit like some medieval and renaissance helmets in that it has a, a deflecting shaped point on it. So bear in mind the front of this um, bayonet trainer here is quite large and blunt, so that is going to have the effect of um, sometimes it will grip against the bars, but you see it will skip off and skid off and deflect the force uh, away from the person's neck uh, fairly effectively. And of course, having that pointed almost like a pig face bassinet shape um, gives it a lot of rigidity as well, rather than some fencing marks suffer from being a bit too flat on the front. And if they're a bit too fl flat and they get hit by something heavy and stiff, then um, they can kind of crumple or cave in or flex in and hit the person in the face. If you have this nice big uh, cone out here, it keeps it away from the person's face and makes it very rigid. So thick steel bars. Yes, indeed, as I mentioned in my other video, the gaps in the bars are quite big. That's because they're intended to be used with this type of bayonet trainer, which if you're only using this type of trainer, that's fine. You can have nice big gaps. If you're using foils or even single sticks, you need something with closer meshes really on there. Otherwise, you've got a risk of something breaking, a blade breaking, or even a splinter of wood just going straight through there and into your eye, which is bad news, okay? So essentially, we've got a metal mesh, which is similar construction, or similar shape, should we say, form to a fencing mask. You've got a bowl, and then you've got a frame which comes around the side and top. And then, what you've essentially got is something a bit like a single stick hilt, isn't it? It's, it's a large leather, thick leather, um, I'd actually, Possibly, it's somewhat similar to saddle leather, I would consider it, um, actually. Uh, but you can see it's fairly, fairly thick in here. And this uh, is a series of plates which are stitched together, go around the top, and then fold at the back. Obviously, if you were wanting to make one of these, and it has a wire around the back of the head, just like a fencing mask does, which originally, you can see there's the remnants of the padding, which unfortunately has disintegrated. Um, obviously, if you were remaking one of these, you could have this coming further down the back and completely protecting, or having a bit hanging down the back to protect the back of the neck uh, and the nape of the neck. Now inside, as you can see, the padding has disintegrated. There were a family of mice living in this, I have to say. Uh, I, know, I only know, not when I found it, but I, I know that because there were mouse droppings inside it. Lovely. There's probably still some in there. Um, and inside, it's essentially cloth. And I hope you can see on video, let's try and get the, it's quite difficult to get, there we go. You can probably see inside is, there we go, horsehair. Um, now horsehair was used a lot for padding things, uh, including furniture incidentally, any furniture restorers out there will know this. Horsehair was used a lot for padding things in the 19th century and even, these uh, padded sparring gloves, this is the left hand bayonet glove, I can only just about get my hand into this, it's a little bit small for me. Even these padded gloves, that is horsehair inside there. And horsehair is amazing um, shock absorbency. Something that we found with experiment, I won't say the company, but a company that I've done a bit of work with have done experiments on this, is that when you have a fibrous padding inside something, rather than a foam padding, is the fibrous padding seems to disperse the energy more effectively than necessarily a, um, a foam padding does. Because when foam gets hit, the force does spread out a bit, but it goes directly through to the thing underneath it. With the hair-like padding, even woolen-type padding inside, it has. It seems to. Sp it needs to. Uh, seems to disperse the force a little bit better. So um, this type of horsehair padding is very, very effective, and you know you can punch it as hard as you like. It basically is like punching a beefed up boxing glove. It feels like a denser boxing glove. And probably the original boxing glove, I'm not even sure, but probably the original boxing gloves had horsehair in them rather than um, whatever they have now, foam, I imagine. Um, so yeah, so it's um, extensively padded 
um, inside and um, uh, so lined with this soft cloth and then I don't know how well you'll be able to see soft cloth and then this horsehair padding in here and it's got these little uh, holes as well so it's kind of aid your hearing and those holes are in the fabric on the inside you can probably just about see there um, it's padded on the underneath here in the top in the sides all the way around so in other words you've got a web almost of padding around your head a bit like almost like a rugby crash um, helmet um, now in terms of the throat some of you will have noticed though a modern fencing mask obviously has what we call the bib underneath the chin protecting the throat and I have to be honest looking at photographs from the period it does seem that sometimes they just didn't have any bib on here and it seems that that role was taken up by the um, the jacket or plastron that was worn underneath some however do have a bib underneath and certainly in the 19th century uh, images we see of similar masks to that not the same mask exactly but similar masks to that being used with single sticks or sabers then they pretty much always have a, um, a collar of some kind um, Right, the other things that they wore for the bayonet fencing was the left-hand glove we've seen already. So this is an American example. Um, it looks like it was never issued or used, probably dates to World War I or soon after, maybe the 20s or 30s. Um, padded, I believe, with horsehair all the way up the fingers, all the way up the thumb, all the way over here. So it's a bit like a giant cushion on top of your hand. Some of them have a ring, and the 19th century ones usually have a ring around here. The ring is to protect against cuts from a sabre. If you're only training bayonet, you don't necessarily need that so much. Um, and then the cuffs can come in various forms. This is made of some weird kind of early... I think it's like almost cardboard impregnated with resin or something. Um, it, it almost looks a bit like fibreglass, but obviously it's not. Um, and inside it's got a sort of felt liner, just presumably for, for comfort. Um, but th as I say, this is like brand new, but not. Uh, it's an old one that's never been used, I think. Um, and interesting little detail, it's got a little pad on the inside of the lip there, presumably because they found that when people were wearing these, sometimes that would get hit and hit on the inside of your, uh, inside of your arm. Um, so sometimes they have a big cuff like this, big stiff cuff. Sometimes they have a shorter version of it. Sometimes they don't have a cuff at all and the person will wear a separate arm thing, more like we do in HEMA these days. Um, personally, I'm actually a big fan, so long as you've got enough wrist mobility, um, I'm a big fan, just trying to get my hands as far as I can with this, I'm a big fan, as long as you can move the wrist around here, I'm quite a big fan of having these built-in big cuffs because they do away with the need to necessarily have separate arm defences. And I kind of think that, well, obviously some modern HEMA gloves, like sparring glove, can have those as an option and I'm a big fan of them actually and um, despite the fact that my own gloves none of them actually do have uh, my HEMA gloves none of them have them so there we go um, the other things that they were wearing so they wear a big padded left hand glove they'd normally wear a normal glove on the right hand because when you're fencing someone with a bayonet it's really the lead hand that's at risk the rear hand's not really so much in any danger so they'd normally have the big padded glove, that's why it's a left-handed one. You'd have the left-handed big padded glove at the front, the non-padded glove at the back, you'd have that big mask on, and then you'd have a padded plastron, uh, which would cover your, certainly this side of you, okay, um, and usually the whole front, sometimes with a collar up here. Um, that would sometimes go all the way down to pretty much the knees or the mid-thigh, so it's protecting the groin. Sometimes they would wear a separate um, groin skirt or a sporran in fact they had a type of padded sporran for protecting the crotch and then very often they'd wear a leg defense on at least one of the legs that would look a bit like a cricket um, shin pad um, protect the knee as well or sometimes they would just have a padding around the knee and they'd not, not bother having anything on the shin. Um, so there we go. Um, that was bayonet fencing equipment of the end of the 19th century beginning of the 20th century and um, in many ways, I often feel like when we're looking at he developing HEMA equipment, we should look, depending on what weapons you're using, but I think sometimes we should draw a bit more inspiration from probably the bayonet fencing equipment um, and maybe less from modern Olympic fencing equipment. Obviously depends. If you're doing foil, maybe even rapier, then fine. That makes more sense to look at modern sport fencing equipment. But if you're looking at maybe longsword or something like that, then 
you know, maybe the bayonet fencing equipment has got some things to teach us. Then again, maybe we've gone past that point, and I would say a lot of the materials and the manufacturing we've got now on modern HEMA equipment is better than they had available to them. So there we go. Um, I hope this has been somewhat interesting, and uh, seeing a bit, of a, a bit more of a close-up of some of this equipment uh, might be um, of passing interest to a few of you. Get, give, us a, uh, give us a like and a subscribe, and I will see you really soon for another video on Scholar Gladiatory Channel. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.